Victor, thanks. It's great to sit down. Two people that are you know, Dallas based. Um, maybe I'll even start just by saying that there are a lot of people that have been on Real Vision lately that are talking purely about the markets in kind of a broad sense, bull market, bear market, uh, you know, credit bubble, not credit bubble. Um, whereas maybe you have some kind of more nuanced uh, views. But if we take a step back, um, maybe somebody watching the interview would, would, would say that we could possibly be from different investing generations. But I think from what I know about you, um, we might look at markets the same way. So here, you know, maybe 10 years or so into a, you know, monetary experiment, just generally, what do you think about markets now and, and, uh, and where we are maybe in the market cycle, the economic cycle, et cetera? Okay. Well, th there's two integrated parts to everything you do in Wall Street. And that's the fundamental and the technical, simple. There's also the psychological and the emotional side of it. But Sentiment. just for the point of your question, uh, we're in a bear market. It's 100%. Uh, now, why do I say that? Uh, perhaps a background to people listening would be important because it's a, it's a very solid statement, so I want to give you the background. Now, I've been, I started in Wall Street in 66, and I started trading in 68. Now, I've probably read three plus thousand books. One of the books <clears throat> was a book uh, by, uh, by a fellow named William Gordon, who was the CEO of Indicated Digest. Now, that's before your time. They were a major force uh, in, in, in the technical end of the business in the 60s. And they took the 10 major indicators at the time. Now, they had odd lot theory, things that mm -hmm. nobody that even knows what that right. means. <laughs> so they, and they traced that back to 1900, 10 different indicators, and then many permutations of those indicators. So the one that came in first was the simplicity of using a 200-day moving average, trading days, and when the price... Uh, whether you use S&P, Dow was popular at the time, closes below that, and the moving average is sloping downwards. It's night and day if it's sloping up, uh, upwards. It right. doesn't count. Sloping downwards, you sell, and then you would buy in the reverse. That concept from, <clears throat> from 1900 to 1966, book came out in 68, yielded you 18.5% compounded. I took it forward. We have a trading staff research firm, and we, we have three PhD math professors, et cetera, and we ran it forward, and they were similar. Now, the second, the second best technical indicator was Dow Theory. Came in at 18%. Again, similar results. Compounded at 18%. Now, the one thing that I did that, that Bill Gordon didn't do was that using real money as such, when you sold, you put the money in one-year bills. He didn't add that dimension. So mine per, perhaps was a little less than the 18 and a half because I added to it by getting yield when I was in cash. So now these two indicators gave bear market signals, one in October, the 200-day moving average was the first, and then lat later in early December, Dow Theory confirmed. So you're in a bear market, and as far as I'm concerned, unless something changes, now they're not, in, nothing is infallible, but, but I lean very heavily that these are accurate. The other uh, part would be the fundamentals. Now, <clears throat> you heard the expression that you know, the, the market has predicted 14 out of the last 10 recessions, and a lot of people use that. Well, that's a very naive statement by anybody who uses that particular uh, phrase. Why is because the market doesn't only predict recessions. It predicts things that can occur that would make the market go down, like war. It predicts war. It predicts... Uh, Political change, for example, in 62, <clears throat> and I was a young lad, I was a teenager then, but I was following the markets, 
And and JFK, who was a very well respected president at the time, he attacked the steel companies for raising prices. No different than Trump today on many different aspects. He attacked them. Well, in those days, it was looked at as socialism. And socialism then was not accepted as even a consideration because we were fighting with the Soviet Union Cold War, so to speak. So uh, uh, the market dropped 26% in less than three months, but no recession followed. The reason was that JFK realized he blundered and he backed off. He dropped it. So he didn't attack the steel companies anymore for raising prices and the markets reversed. So like I say, there, there are many instances of that over the, over the years. It doesn't mean the market's wrong. It means the market predicts many things. Now, when you have the Fed raising rates, as Jerome Powell did in September and recently on December 19th, that is a fundamental event. Everybody knows, that's why everybody follows the Fed, that if they're raising rates, markets don't like this. And you usually, uh, you know, you're taking away the punch bowl is the old expression. And, and basically, you, you, you go into recession every time the Fed does this. Now, let me just preface that I think Powell and the other nine members who voted to raise rates the extra quarter, even though it was very well discounted, was a major error. This is going to go down in history as one of the worst errors the Fed has ever made, including the, the 2932 debacle. So I, I look at that, that as long as they keep on track, now they're already talking down the other cuts. Kaplan from, from Dallas is already saying, well, maybe we should wait till after the second quarter. And I mean, they're already backing off. But if you change the fundamentals, you change the outcomes. So if they back off from right now selling QT and the rise, the two more increases in interest rates, you, you have to consider that. And that may change the trends of the markets because the fundamentals are changing. But the key is that right now, it's going to be very hard to do that. And the reason is the world is heading into recession. Europe, Japan, China, the, the virtual world. We were the strongest economy in the world. <clears throat> and now this psychological switch, like turning off a light, changed everything. So we are weakening. The data is weakening. If you looked at the Richmond Fed and you looked at the Dallas Fed results, the economy is already weakening. So this was, this was because of, in my opinion, ego and perhaps even some politics. Uh, Jerome Powell was adamant about what he did. And there were many other people besides obviously Trump that didn't want him to do that, that it was the wrong move. So we're in a bear market. Bear markets, by the way, you go back to 1899, the market, once it proclaims a bear market, six months is the average, you're in a recession. So what the markets are saying now, all things being equal, in July, you're going to be in a recession in the United States. So from what I know about you, um, you've been kind of skeptical maybe of the post-global financial crisis monetary policy regime and that maybe the manipulation of prices, interest rates being the most important, you know, would eventually have consequences. On the other hand, we're talking now about Powell and the Fed uh, making a mistake in raising at this point. So uh, again, maybe a case that our central bankers um, are timing cycles incorrectly. But how do you square the two? Okay. The, uh, originally, when we had the 208 crash, uh, you what the Fed did was sort of natural and no one can critique them, uh, although a pure... Th the purists would, okay? But let's, let's assume that that was the right move. But to keep zero interest rates for seven years and to do three QEs 
and I believe there was at least one Operation Twist, maybe there was two, you, that was, a, again, an, a huge error. Now, if they were normal, and you, know, you, you may have heard, because you're a young guy, the four-year cycle, right? So you go up three years into an election, usually the first year is when you do all the damage, because people forget. <clears throat> so it would have been natural to raise rates in 213 to some degree. Now, even think of it this way. In 210, when we were in a recovery, the, re uh, the recovery ended in June, uh, the recovery began in June of 209. So let's say in 210, you raised rates 50 basis points a year for seven years. You know, one in June, one in December, small, steady, you know, you can change your mind if you want to. You, you'd be at neutral rates, which is what the Fed uses as their, their talking point these days. So they didn't do that. They didn't raise rates in 2013. They kept and you think the same. recovery would have continued, whether it was a market recovery or economic recovery? Y yes, in because, because you, you remember you're adding now QTs to this, or QEs. So you got to put that in conjunction. If you were doing QE, why not raise rates slowly and maybe in one year raise it 25 basis points? I mean, I'm not trying to look back and, and program what should be done. I'm only saying that you can't all of a sudden, Trump wins. They raise rates eight times. They raised rate once under Obama, 215 December. And then they raise rates in December of two, uh, two, uh, 216 after Trump won and seven other times. So eight times, I mean, not that 2% means anything. It means something psychologically. And it means uh, that if you're you're on a almost a heroin addict of interest rate, low interest rates, and you do too much, you 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 pop the psychology. And PEs are psychological, right? There's no. The, I come from what's called the Austrian school of economics. What they would say is all value is subjective. So when people start talking about value and PEs, it's subjective. In the in the in the in the thirties, Lorelide, which was a uh, tobacco company, traded at six times dividend. Now that's you compare that to to uh, Amazon today. There's a big spread. So what is the difference in that spread? It's what people sure. think, and you know a market is is valid, and what people think is what it is. But the key is. It's subjective. It's not object. It's not two and two. So the bottom line is, is that, is that <clears throat> you, uh, you, you, they, they did too much. And when, and I can tell you because I was playing this and everybody knew they were going to raise rates, at least that was the prediction. As soon as they raised rates, the market collapsed, which meant they shouldn't have done it. Because even though people expected it, it was the wrong thing to do. And this was outlined very well by Stan Drunkenmiller and, and, and uh, Kevin Wash in the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal had editorials as well. But those are two prominent people. And there were many other pros that, that, that understood this. Sure. So it was a very bad move. So, he, so I, I hear what you're saying. I also like Austrian economics. And another cornerstone is that the the manipulation of prices inevitably leads to misallocation of capital. And so if if we've been in a decade uh, maybe of the the most abusive or the mo a period where we have most abused um, the price of money, is all of this a big reckoning uh, based on violation of those cornerstone tenets of of Austrian economics? Yeah, without a doubt. And and what the what the central banks of the world, twenty three major ones, they have abused the 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 uh, wizard's wand. They have taken it to where, if you wanted to, let's say, measure Austrian school versus Milton Friedman, who I loved, but he was wrong about the the increasing the money supply at a steady rate, because politicians don't do that. So this is living proof what's happened, you know, since he died, unfortunately. 
But the key is the Austrian school said, no, politicians will never do the right thing. They will always use whatever power you give them to benefit themselves. So uh, the key is they, they abuse the wizard's wand here by too many QEs. And like I said, if you wanted interest rates to be a little normalized, during those QEs, they should have raised rates very slowly. But shrinking the balance sheet and raising rates together well, now, is more shri- yeah, it's, it's too much. It's catastrophic. This is catastrophic. Okay, so you said something that maybe leads to a good segue. We talked about politicians and their ability to use power, abuse power. Um, I think another topic that you've written elegantly about and that is of interest to you is how power shifts globally um, are going to be an increasingly important factor in various markets. Right. What what the most important thing to me is, aside from as a trader, it's what the Fed is doing, right? But, but as an investor, <clears throat> uh, I will look at political trends. Now, you very rarely hear people talking about political trends, but political trends dictate what central banks eventually do because they change the power structure of those central banks. Now, Trump didn't do that. Probably his, if I had to pick his worst fault, he doesn't know how to hire people. I mean, he doesn't understand ideology of who he's hiring. So he picked Powell, who was chosen by by Obama. He's an environmentalist. He ran an environmental fund. He's an establishment guy. he, by nature, doesn't like Trump. <laughs> so I, I, that was the wrong choice. Kevin Walsh would have been the best. But near the end of there, he chose him, and he's chosen many other people that ideologically don't fit his bill. But getting back to your point, the political trends around the world are moving to the term that's used as nationalist populist. And it's center-right, and to give you an example of the power of this, if you look at Europe, 2017, there were 946 elections within the European community, 28 countries or so. They lost 94% of them. 94% of the center left lost in 2017. Now, that's obviously we're moving to the to the right. Now, what does right stand for here? Less regulation, low taxes, uh, less government dictates, smaller government. All of those have fundamental consequences to what happens to interest rates and what happens to the economy. Trump was successful to a larger degree because he basically put forth some of those policies you'll notice that Europe will never increase taxes. They're, they're a socialist nation, if you want to include the, the people who run it. But then you look at the European leaders. Well, any day, uh, Macron, <laughs> with this yellow vest protest, he's got an 18% approval rating. Yeah. He's a dead man walking. He's never going to win another election. He might be ousted at any time because his, his popularity is so low. He's, he's angered the people. And, you, you know, you, France has a history of when you anger them, they revolt. Theresa May, same thing. She's a globalist. She's a New World Order globalist. She doesn't want to do what the people voted for. So she's trying to get around it. She could get a no-confidence vote. She, she could be out. Angela Merkel, perhaps the, the most powerful person in the world uh, after, well, during the Obama administration— and she's gone. She's now just staying in her place, but she says she's not going to run again, and she may get ousted early. So you see, these trends are really what you have to watch because the monetary policy will follow those trends. So that's, a, that's an interesting point, or maybe it raises an interesting question. So we have monetary policy under, let's call them more centrist or center-left policies globally coming out of the global financial crisis. And they chose, or some people would say were forced, into aggressive monetary policy. 
We just finished talking a little bit about the U.S. and maybe the finger trap that we're in here, which is to say that the economy looked good. We didn't raise rates. We start raising rates. We're late cycle, and maybe we're doing it all at the wrong time. What do some of these? What options do some of these other countries, these other economies, have? Given that you're at extremely low historical interest rates already,、uh, asset purchase programs and the liquidity. That they have given in,、uh, to the markets and supported the markets are already out. Even if we have populist movements, if we move to the right, do you think that the influence you mentioned on this on the central banks will have any effect? Well, the the answer to getting growth is the same as what what Trump did. You you got to you got to lower taxes. <clears throat> Ideally, you got to slow spending. So you never hear of Japan, who, by the way, has a tax increase coming in October of 2019, and, and, and the European Union doesn't even talk about tax decreases.、Right. But it's harmed the people. The people are basically serfs, and many people in the United States are serfs. They work to survive. They get a little piece of the action. That's what a serf does, and. They can't make it anymore, and that's why when 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 Macron raised the gas tax to seven and a half dollars a gallon,、uh, the people revolted because they can't afford it, they can't pay it, and therefore you you know you had this happen.、Uh, the, if you've seen the yellow vest movements、sure. and you know the fires and burning of cars and things, the people revolting. So the point is the way that you know now I'm being an economist side of me, I'm saying well why don't you lower taxes? Less regulation, less spending, ideally less spending. Trump didn't do that, so less spending, and and you'd get growth, and then you'd get interest rates. I mean, you know, the three year, the two year uh, uh, bond is is yielding.、Uh, I think it's minus thirty basis points, could be more, and inflation is three percent. Now, inflation is going to drop, but th- the point is. How do you buy? How do you? Buy, I think it's. Excuse me. It's the ten year. There are too many numbers. The ten year is minus sixty, with a three percent inflation rate. Now, again, as I say, inflation will decline because oil has declined, and that's why, again, Powell made a mistake. And any central bank that is, you know, trying to raise rates now is the wrong move. The key is they they kept that policy in Europe because they didn't want to lower taxes. They're globalists. They want to keep the people working for the people who, you know,、sure. as, as Steve Bannon would call them, the Davos Party. So that's who、uh, they want to do. But it, it's a, it's easy to solve. It's the ideology that's very difficult to get over the heads of the people in power. So tying this back to markets and central banks, etc., it sounds to me, parsing through what you're saying, that at least when we're talking about the developed world、uh, and developed world central banks who who have. Uh, perhaps been the most aggressive in their monetary response to really the crisis ten years ago now might just be hamstrung,、uh, even if the politics shift in the direction of attempted market-friendly behavior. At least from a policy standpoint, their options might be limited. It, it, they are. Europe is is extremely limited. So is Japan because they didn't raise rates.、Right. They should have raised rates. They were afraid. Now they're in a corner. How, you can't lower rates when you have negative rates, right? And、uh, so they're 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 toast. They've killed themselves, and I sort of mean that literally. The European Union cannot survive. Now, predicting when a you know when a, a sort of a nation ends is a very bad thing for traders to do, <laughs> because you you know you look at the Soviet Union; they lasted seventy two years. So you can't, you can't. They always have tricks, you know, that they put forth. So I don't know when the European Union will break up, but it will.、Yeah. And right now, it's probably in a more precarious state than it's ever been because the the three top countries are Germany, England, and France in that order, and they're all in、yeah, trouble. Yes, I mean,、sure. the leaders are are out or ready to get to to be thrown out. So if we step back and take, you know, view at the Whole world? Is there anywhere,、uh, maybe in the emerging markets,、uh, where you think the combination of political change, less central bank 
uh, dovishness to well, date <clears throat> leads to opportunity? It, it, right now, you're you're in in my view what what would be the I call defense or preserving principle unless you want to play the short side. The short side is a difficult thing to play at this level because there's an incentive for Trump and Xi Jinping to do a deal. They do a deal on trade, the markets are going to rally. I mean, there's going to be a psychological big move up. That would be the time to, to short, but you know, not the first day of the first week or the, even maybe after three weeks. But the key is that's coming. So you really, at this stage, very difficult, unless you're a trader, to put on a short position and, and you know, sort of go away. But the bottom line is, is, is that the, the, the world is in a precarious position, so you've got to be on the defense. Where to put your money? I mean, if you're talking about a nation, right now, Brazil, I would look for investments in Brazil. I would do the Jimmy Rogers game, you know. I mean, <laughs> this guy, uh, Bolsonaro, is going to do good things, in my opinion. And Switzerland, because Switzerland is, is, is basically a place that is neutral all the time. Uh, they have negative rates because they, don't, they, they wanted to stop people from putting their money in the Swiss franc. So, you know, the, let's put it this way, that if I were, and I'm not recommending a trade, but just in theory, I'd be long the Swiss franc, short the euro, right? That would be a trade. I'd be long uh, uh, the Brazilian real, I'd be short the Mexican peso, although the Mexican peso technically looks very good. So I'm not saying do this now. I'm saying from a Keep fundamental- it in the back pocket. Yeah, you just look at it in yeah. the back pocket, but the chart on the Mexican peso looks very good. So you can't short the Mexican peso here. The key is that right now you want to look for nations that are going to do what Trump did in theory, and you want to avoid the nations that are fighting it. France, until Macron goes, is in turmoil, Yeah. right? Interesting. Well, so if we bring it back then to the U.S., because you just now you know, point back to what Trump did, um, he obviously was very vocal about his impact on the markets um, while they were rising. And as recently, I think, as yesterday, uh, talked about the correction as a glitch and really a misunderstanding by the American people. Is there anything to comment on that in terms of your worldview? Well, <clears throat> you know, his weakness is basically his insecurity. He has to tell you that he's the greatest, you know what I mean? <laughs> I kind of laugh at him. It doesn't bother me, whatever he says. It's his personality. I don't care about his personality. I care about his policies. But the point is, his weakness is he he speaks too much. And to take the, the credit while the market was going up, obviously, he he called it right. He said, don't raise rates. The market's down because the Fed did raise rates too much, too fast. So he's right. But, but there's he, been times where he's been made very much in favor of raising rates. He seems to have two views. You know, wants a strong dollar, maybe because of the psychological. Um, well, I, I think Larry Kudlow was influential in that. I don't know if he ever wanted really a strong dollar. He wanted a, a stable dollar. Because he, he understands dollar goes lower, your goods are cheaper, you sell more. But but yes, he 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 is all over the place because he doesn't he doesn't have uh, what I'll call constitutional principles that never change. You know, for example, you should never employ price controls, right? right. That's a principle, <clears throat> and not that he's for them. I'm just using that as an example. The, the point is, is is that he he has now gotten himself in some soup because he's taken credit for the market increase, and now it's going to be political because it's not his fault that the Fed raised rates, but he's going to get the blame. So he, he politically harms himself far more than he would if he just shut up because people would, would attribute what's happening to the economy. If you lower taxes and you cut regulations and the market goes up, you don't have to say, well, I did it. Right. <laughs> so he, he, he hurts himself in many ways. And I, I repeat, his worst mistake is 
how he hires people. He hires people because he thinks they're smart. Vladimir Lenin is very smart. He's the smartest dictator that ever lived. Would you hire? <laughs> Would you? I don't know. His ideology is is uh, opposite yours. Mm. So the key is he makes these mistakes. Then he winds up learning about the people that they're different. He fires them, and he looks bad. Right. And there's no continuity. Right. So <clears throat> if we if we maybe shift back to politics and power politics and the globe, you know, how do you as a trader? Uh, as an investor, as an advisor, uh, you know, how do you think about the next few years? Is it very much, you said you used the word defense earlier in the interview, but are your time horizons shrinking um, in terms of how you look at, at the markets or investments? Are you trying to be more tactical? Uh, or is it, uh, you know, are we just waiting for the signal uh, for a bigger trend again? Well, let's examine two points to answer that question, but I can only do this, uh, you know, by looking at the, at the past, the, the, the experience of the past helps guide you to the future. In 1854, the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research, started to classify recoveries and recessions, <clears throat> and they've been doing it ever since. Now, from 1854 to 209, the, the average recovery was 38.7 months, 38.6 months. Since 82, it's 100 months. What's happened is the Fed got this magic wand, this, the wizard's wand, and they said, you know, why should we let the market? This is a Greenspan concept, sure. you know, being too smart for his own good. I'll extend these things. I'll put in the Greenspan put. We'll keep the markets going. We'll keep the recovery going. And so when you do that, however, when the game ends, for whatever reason, you get far greater downsides. I mean, the, the declines... Uh, from 1854, there were a couple of depressions, uh, one in the 1870s in 1929-32, but you had 2002, there were three years of decline. The only other time that happened was in 1929-32. 29, 30, and 31, 32 actually wound up being up year, happened in June. And the, the point is that you had 208. So now you're kind of in a difficult spot because even though we've raised rates to 2.5%, you're not going to get much VIG by dropping rates 2.5%, you know, although it would, it would definitely cause a rally. But the key is, is that the Fed is, is in trouble because it hasn't, it, it hasn't budgeted itself properly. Like Europe is in worse trouble. Japan is in worse trouble. But you know, we're the we're the best of the bunch. But the key is 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 that you you really have to expect all things being equal, meaning no change, <laughs> you can have a horrendous bear market here. Horrendous. Because you you're starting from a high plateau of ten years up, uh, the longest bull market in history, three thousand and almost five hundred days, and you have 5,000-year-old uh, interest rates in Europe, and since America was developed, let's call it 230 years ago, these are the lowest interest rates in 200 years. And by the way, just for your, your audience, when the Fed started to raise rates December 16th, 2015, from zero to a quarter, the 30-year was 3% exactly on that day. It, it was 297 last night. Yeah. So you see the long end... Is, is having, is seeing the problems. The bond market is a great foreteller of future economic news. So you really have a, a, an issue where you've raised rates nine times, but the long end of the market is lower than when you started. So now you, the, the yield curve is inverting in some respects. Last night, the, the, the one year was 260, and the 10-year was 265. Yeah. 
I mean, you, yeah, you're in trouble. You see, <laughs> the Fed is never going to be able to complete what it said it was going to do. That's not going to help. The key is what does it do with its balance sheet? Because that is where the rubber meets the road. Sure. If they continue to sell, then <laughs> you know, then th- then we're we're going to see something in the order of a thirty-seven or a twenty-nine thirty. Now, to what extent do you look at you know different parts of of the market? Because um, despite it not you know, being my day job exactly, um, never really been U.S. focused, and probably have less of a technical bend than you have. You know, I think you'd have to have your head in the sand to not realize that we've had a very concentrated leadership in the U.S. markets for a long time. Maybe being uh, tech. Tech heavy. Um, I think all of our all, all the people watching know the names, um, and the breath has maybe been absent. And even though we look at the December that we just have, we're filming. You know, now here in January, we look at the worst December since the Great Depression, and we might say, "My goodness, the markets are just falling apart." You, you've had these miniature blow ups and major bear markets in different sectors. Uh, in the U.S. markets and in many global markets over the last several years, perhaps you know, foreshadowing um, that ultimately the the last shoe would drop, being big U.S. tech, uh, maybe healthcare. Um, but to what extent are you looking at you know, the sub industries of, of of the S and P, and is there anything that you that you take from the price action? You know, there or between them, tech versus maybe the resource sector. Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay, first a little background. The early, the late 60s, early 70s, we had the conglomerate craze. There were these conglomerates, everybody loved conglomerates. There were many of them. Then in the late 70s, we had the Nifty 50, Avon Polaroid. I was a block trader for, we. I sold my firm to Whedon & Company and they made me a block trader as an options expert. And I used the options to hedge the block trading I did in the Nifty 50, uh, that was kind of my, the glamour stocks, they called them it. So, and they all have, they all get nailed. If the, if the, if the market is going to come down, 73, 74, conglomerates died, Nifty 50, 80, 81, they got killed. I mean, it, it, everything, when the markets go down, everything goes down. So the FANG stocks are, you know, the tech stocks are over because they're overpriced relatively speaking, and don't forget, all these, I mean, not many people talk about this. The, the, the Facebooks, Googles of the world make their money from advertising, right? So if you have a recession, which we haven't seen since 2008, what's the first thing you cut? Advertising, sure. because nobody's buying anything. So, so there's a fundamental, let's say, behind the scenes, obvious to me, that if you own these Internet stocks, let's call them, they're they're going to get sold aggressively for fundamental reasons. Now, if you want to call tech, you know, let's call Microsoft and some of the some of the uh, semiconductor stocks. Let's call that tech. Most of them have moved offshore. South Korea, Taiwan, China build those things. So we don't really have a big tech industry per se in the United States. All those jobs are moved offshore for the same reason the manufacturing jobs are moved, just cheaper labor. <clears throat> so all I can say is, is that you can't hide behind any group. And now, because you have so many of these ETF indices sure. and so many stock indices, you're really trading stocks are stocks. And being a stock picker, there are some excellent stock pickers like Lee Koopman, who recently is a man I know very well and a friend of mine, I would say. And and he he's excellent, but he's best in bull markets because he'll outperform. But if you're long stocks in a bear market, nobody wins, you know, because all those stocks are going to go down. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly looks precarious. You mentioned, obviously, how low rates are historical, historically speaking, can go back thousands of years in Europe, hundreds of years in the U.S. The, uh, the debt roll for U.S. corporates looks pretty uh, scary at the moment. 
uh, particularly in this rate environment. Yeah, now you're talking corporates. I'm talking corporates, yeah, yeah sorry. True. He, here's another, you know, I'm a man that is a researcher, so I have a lot of facts, and I'm losing my memory in many areas, but not in these areas. <laughs> if you, from 61 to 208, the end of 208, beginning of 209, if you took the 30 year, the 30 day T bill and the 30 year long bond, you add them together, you divide by two, you compound that from, from, from 26 to 19 to 2008, the interest, uh, excuse me, in this case from 61, not from 26, from 61. So 1961 to 2008, 2008. the average interest rate adding the T-bill to the long bond divided, divided by, by two. two is 599, let's say 6%. Yesterday, the average was 269. That's 2.2 times to get to six. Now, what does this mean? There's not a price in the world that's accurate. Coca-Cola in India is not priced correctly. Now, I don't know if it should be higher or lower, but there is no price correctness in the world. So all prices are going to be adjusted once interest rates go back up. <clears throat> and that is kind of obvious, but when you say it the way I'm saying it, I want to make people pause. There has been nothing but a huge distortion of real estate prices, of stock prices, of paintings. A painting sold for $450 million. I mean, I'm not in the in the art world, but I mean, you know, this is all based on the fact that stocks have been elevated and people have, ex, you know, so much money and they try to diversify. So the, this gets back to your Austrian economics band, co right? Correct. All, all value is subjective. The key here is is that you you must understand that this is going to be reset one way or another. It's going to be reset. Now, again, timing is hard to predict here when. Like, for example, if I said, well, interest rates are going to be 6% again on average, I mean, I can't predict that. I can't predict when. But someday it will. The, the conclusion to that is that anything with paper money will not protect you. So if you own, if you're wealthy and you own stocks or you own real estate, in paper money terms, they're going to, they're going to be depreciated. The most unvalued thing, and me and many of the other people on, on uh, your your the sponsor here, Real Vision TV, is gold and silver are the most the cheapest things in the world relative to other products in the world or other objects in the world. So you know, I'm an investor in gold. <clears throat> I'm an investor in silver, in the physical, <clears throat> and basically. Uh, uh, I'm comfortable and, you know, I'm, I've been an investor a long time. It's just a question of proportions. So to me, I, that's a place to invest. Now, it's not a place to trade. Very hard trading gold and silver. Very hard. So I wouldn't recommend that. But, you know, where you put your money, we talked about, you know, maybe places like Switzerland and now maybe Brazil. But the key is also from, from, a, from a, a sector point of view, the mining stocks, which if gold goes up, they actually are leveraged up because costs stay the same and the price goes up so they have higher margins. Sure. So mining stocks are actually better than the physical unless the world has real problems. Real problems. Then, then the physical is better than the, than the mining sure. stocks. I should point out that Homestake Mining, which was the biggest mining gold mining company in the world, in 1929 was $8. In 1936 traded at $70. So you, you see mining stocks can go up and, and you couldn't own gold in those days because Roosevelt right. confiscated, confiscated the gold. Sure. Have we missed anything? Well, yeah, L let, me, let me mention debt. Now I've been a huge researcher on debt. Everybody talks about debt. And I believe and, and with all due respect and great deference to Mr. Dalio, because he, he's recently done some videos and he put out a new book, I think. And what most people are not aware of 
is that starting in 214, um, the rules were changed that have a huge benefit to the U.S. government when they sell debt. Now, we all know they got a trillion dollar deficit and uh, you, you got 22 trillion on balance sheet and you got 10 trillion off balance sheet, which very few people talk about. Forget the unfunded liabilities. Uh, if you want to know what the real deficit is, you got to look at the gap way of figuring the deficit because you got to take into account unfunded liabilities. Yeah. You wouldn't have a deficit of a trillion, you have a deficit of six trillion. So you could see, you know, th there's lots of games that are played. But the key is most people are just not aware of these rules. Now, if you buy debt as a bank, this applies to banks. And my, let me give you the, the bottom line before I explain why. The government can, the U.S. government can sell all the debt it wants. There is no debt deficits and debt does not matter at all. Now, it will someday. But it doesn't if you want to sell debt. In other words, the government will always be able to fund itself. It has nothing to do with overseas. Most commentators, you know, who went to school, got master's degrees, they're not up on the times. <clears throat> so what do I mean by this? Basel III, you have no capital hits to a bank. They're exempt. Sovereign debt is exempt. This goes for, you know, the ECB and Japan. So there's no harm done there. <clears throat> you buy government debt, you don't have, you haven't put aside any reserves. So there's no reserve hit. You buy government debt, they have an account now, and this was in 214, where it's called hold to maturity, HTM accounts. The other account is available for sale. So if you're a bank and you want to buy $100 billion of U.S. debt, 30 years, which is what you want, because you get the interest on that debt, you have no risk. There's no mark to market, because you put it in your, your HTM, HTM account. account. So I know enough about this to be dangerous, but I want to make sure everybody's following you so far. So we're talking about the U.S. government and its ability to fund itself. The U.S. government sells government bonds on the spectrum of maturities. Some people would sit out there saying, well, at some point, they'll be absent a buyer. But what you're explaining now is that because of rule changes in a closed system where our banks or global banks are able to buy sovereign debt without putting aside any capital, meaning that there's no hit to their capital ratio owning it, you're saying there's essentially an unlimited demand especially given that there's no mark to market, so there's no earnings risk, et cetera. Correct. And they will always be the bidder for these uh, yeah. outside of maybe it's, some it's extraordinary a, circumstances. It's a, it's a real Rothschild arbitrage. <laughs> the banks have put themselves in a position to purely arbitrage the interest. Nothing can happen to them. And a matter of fact, they didn't get the last point, but they print the money. Right. So if they come in, they just write a check to the, to the treasury, if, they, if they're bidding in the auction as one of the primary dealers, and they print the money, just like Banking 101, where you print money to people. Of course, there's a reserve when you make normal loans. In this case, there's no reserve because the government will print the money and give it to you. I mean, there is some logic behind it that is not prudent, but there is logic. If, if you can't lose because the Treasury will give you the money, then if you... If you're buying bonds below par, you have no risk. Right. So I only say that because, again, I'm not suggesting that you should buy bonds and you can't lose. I'm saying that a bank can buy bonds and it can fund something without, without the normal process taking place. Now, by the way, if you call a central bank and you ask them about this, it's not easy to get information, and they won't talk to you. They don't really want this. Let's say you can research it, and you can find these rules about what you know what the what the reserve requirement would be if you buy a a two year 
U.S. government bond or note in this case, and uh, you'll find it. But but they don't want to, <laughs> let's say, tell you easily. So if you call, they'll say, well, email this department. You'll email that department. You'll never hear from them. I tried it. So they don't really want to confirm. They want you to confirm, but they don't want to tell you. So we started down this line of talk was debt generally. And we started and now and we started by saying, you know, let's talk about government debt. I think that's essentially where we're going. And our ability to fund ourselves in perpetuity. And they're based on what you just explained, there might be good reason to believe that as long as our banks are on board, which maybe they would be strong armed to be at all times, that in a closed system we could perpetually fund uh, our deficits as long as everybody continued playing they, the they're game. They're incentivized to do it. They're incentivized to do it. Now, if the only question I'd have for you, again, since you brought up Austrian economics, you know, ends up being the definition of inflation, which oftentimes can prick problems in deficits and in bonds. And we look at, or I think the market looks at silly measures like CPI, and we believe that that's inflation. But if you are true Austrian economist, you'd say that the increase in the money supply and the growth in money supply is actually inflation. So when the go government, our government or any other one prints money and whatever money aggregate you want to use starts expanding, that's the true inflation number. Yeah, it's, it's, it's how you define what inflation is. You're on the right track. And by the way, avoid corporate bonds was the point of that story because this doesn't apply to corporates. Right. Corporates, they got reserves and they don't have, they don't have the same ability to not take losses as I mean, if, if and we're seeing it, the yeah, the markets yeah. are locked up there. Right, right. A corporate bond can go out of business. The U.S. government doesn't go out of business; it just prints more money. But getting back to the inflation point, here is the key question. And I was wrong on this, so let me put myself right out there. When the when the government was doing when the Fed was doing QEs, you would have assumed there'd be hyperinflation, and the reason there wasn't, <clears throat> and I, I give the Fed credit for this one, is because they they basically took money and they didn't give it to the people. They gave it to wealthy investors, insiders, banks. And, and so if, if, let's say you're worth $100 million, $100 billion, and I come to you and I say, look, I want to buy your bonds. And here's $100 billion, you give me the bonds. Well, you're not going to go spend... You, you know, you can only buy a couple of yachts. So taking a step back, what you're saying <laughs> is that the velocity of money, which is the critical part of which, which money is, printing's correct, correct, impact correct. on inflation, never picked up. Velocity it's, stayed It's at low. a 50-year low, right? right? Because you're giving money to the people in exchange for an asset, and the people who you're exchanging that asset for are wealthy people who are not going to spend the money but reinvest the money whether it be stocks, which m most of them did, or, or bonds. But the point is, th you didn't give the money to the people. Now, let me just put this in, in, into its context. In 1920, when Germany lost World War I, and there was this thing called reparations, they had to pay for the expenses. Well, they bankrupted Germany. Well, Germany printed the mo printed money, but they gave it to the people. So what did the people do? They spent it. Right. See, so if you don't give money to the people, you're not going to see as long as velocity is dropping. That's your key. That you know, there's no turnover. Right. I mean, in in the twenties, nineteen twenty, the the coming into nineteen twenty two and three, which were the bad years. You, you had money turnover velocity of 1.5, which is about what it is today in the U.S. It went to 12. So money turned over once a, once a month. The money supply turned over once a month instead of one and a half times a year. So you could see that's where you get your inflation. Right. So again, just to, to not, you know, not, let's say, put in context, because governments have tricky ways to do things. So if they want to stimulate the economy and stimulate wealth, they just give it to the wealthy people who invest it and don't spend it. And you don't see it in the CPI. You see it in the stock market, the art market, the real estate right. market, et cetera. I don't want to complicate things, but I think 
when we talk about you know wealthy people in this case, the money that was printed mainly went to banks, right. and banks mostly put that excess liquidity back to the Fed in excess reserves, right? So the big economic conundrum, and I'm speaking a little bit above my pay grade here, but I think to synthesize what you've been saying, all of this money was printed, but as you said, instead of going to the people or instead of going into the real economy, it ended up really amongst the banks. And because the banks weren't lending it, we didn't have maybe, some people would say, would argue we didn't have real economic growth, which would come from lending it to the people, which then meant spending sure. by the people. And it ended up at the Fed in terms of excess reserves or in other places where velocity of money wouldn't take up. Uh, that liquidity, again, really became a manifest itself in speculative activity, like the market or, frankly, just on the uh, Fed balance true. sheet. true. Exactly what happened. But, but some of the people did get the some of the money and they, like I say, they invested it, not spent it. And, and that's part of it. But what you said is, is accurate a hundred percent, but that's why you didn't get inflation because the money they, they paid for the one of, I think may have been the first time in history, but I'm not sure they paid interest on reserves. So the right. banks didn't have the incentive to lend it, to loan out the money. That's right. So where does that bring us today? Because again, I don't want to make the conversation overtly bearish, um, it's been a, a long cycle of people expecting that this, you know, uh, policy eventual mistake was going to have its reckoning in the market, and we haven't uh, until very recently. So again, wary of, of crying wolf here. But when we look at all the things that you've talked about, you know, political change, but political change in places where uh, monetary policy has already been extreme. We talk about real economic activity. Um, uh, waning, despite again the punch bowl being in front of the economy for the last you know ten years, uh, and also now turning over. Um, now we, we we've talked about velocity of money and 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 why there's been no inflation, and it's because throughout this apparent economic expansion that we've had over the last ten years, lending has actually and real economic activity, as some would measure it, never really picked up. And now we're potentially going into recession, and there's even less probability that the banks are going to use that capital that they have for, for lending purposes. So a lot of moving pieces, but but how does this filter down into Victor's view of, of the world going forward? It's got lots of problems. And unless things change, less policies change, we're back to where we, we started. You're in a bear market. You're going to be in a recession in, by July, statistically speaking. Maybe it'll be August. Maybe it'll be September. You have to now. If there's major changes, you have to filter that. Right, but in. things being equal, all things being equal, you're in a recession in six months, and it's begun. I mean, the the, the you look at the the Dallas Fed uh, manufacturing report, and 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 the, the other one that came out was Richmond. I mean, they look pretty terrible to me. Yeah. Certainly so, a lot of so indicators rolling So, over. you know, the key here is survival, right? <laughs> Staying alive. You know, Jimmy Rogers, I know him a long time. Every time I meet him, sometimes we meet in the men's room in a restaurant. I mean, he now moved to, to Singapore, so I don't see him as much. But every time I see him, he says, are you still solvent? I said, yeah, how you doing, Jimmy? Yeah, I'm still solid. So that was our favorite exchange of, uh, of words because you never know <laughs> when right. things, you know, I mean, the markets could be up, going up and, and many pros could be short. So uh, thank goodness I didn't lose a lot of money on the upside being short. I was short once or twice on a trading level where, where I used options and I lost a part of that. But uh, you know, I, I didn't Stay short solid. the market on the way up, but let me also say that I missed the bulk of the move because I never believed the Fed would continue to play the game as they did. So I've been very conservative for the last. And, and so uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, this is all new to most of the old money managers who never seen things like this. Well, I think you, that actually might be, at least in my opinion, one of the most interesting lead-ins of, of the conversation so far. Because as I said in the beginning of the interview, but I'll repeat, we at least 
externally from an age perspective or from different investing generations. I was very lucky uh, to, to cut my teeth in the industry for a firm who was on the right side during the financial crisis, also big believers in Austrian economics, uh, skeptics of extraordinary monetary policy, et cetera. Um, so I think I've always kind of carried that chip along with me that uh, that that markets can can get very weird very fast, um, and that there is a such thing as a bear market mentality versus a bull market mentality. But one of the things that you know I'd say maybe keeps me up at night, or certainly keeps the wheels in in my brain moving, is that most investors today, uh, and getting to your point, um, really are just of the bull market generation. Right, uh, and and you've done such a good job today of walking us through stats and statistics going back, in some cases, hundreds of years, um, which shed a lot of light on you know what happens in different parts of the cycle. But one thing again makes me a little bit nervous here is that we have a lot of market participants who aren't really students of history; um, they aren't even students of near-term history, like two thousand and eight, um, or they certainly didn't live it firsthand. Um, so. Uh, if everything that you're saying is true, we we market as a whole might be woefully unequipped um, to deal with it. Correct. The P.T. Barnum line, you know, the annual crop of suckers. I mean, I don't mean that if people lose money in the downside that, that they're suckers. I mean that they've been led to drink this Kool-Aid and the Fed would save them. Now, the question you have to ask is, why did 10 members vote to raise rates when to anybody who knows markets, they wouldn't have raised rates? Is it political? It, are they now become a political? I mean, inflation is one of their mandates, price stability. They've got 2% going out for three more years in their projections. Right. Uh, unemployment is 3 seven or whatever the lay 3.8 whatever it is i mean so what are they targeting they're targeting growth they're targeting gdp why that's not part of their mandate it's trump political. is trump is right he just doesn't express himself well <laughs> so do, do you think that if the fed had stayed on hold that the market would have had a positive reaction yeah i, I do I think it would have been very po because everybody was expecting him, like I said, to raise rates, but they didn't believe they really would do it because they said it. See, they guided you to what they were going to do, and then they did it, but they didn't change their, they, you know, with all the editorials, like I said, there are many in the Wall Street Journal aside from Druckenmiller, and they, they still raise rates. So they, they really made a horrible error. They're going to be on par with 29. Now, how do they get out of this mess? Kaplan, eight hours ago, yeah. was saying, well, maybe we should wait till after the first, second quarter. And, you know, they're already trying to walk back some of it because they're seeing, they're seeing light. Well, that's all very interesting. You know, there are definitely some people in the market that, that perhaps incorrectly thought that a hold would be a signal that the wheels were really coming off. No, that's not the way it works. That, that, that is a, that's a great talking point. It's a great excuse. It's two and two. If you raise right, you, you know what? I mean, people are paying, it all goes to credit card debt. I mean, right now, if, if you get a statement, and, you know, obviously I pay off all my statements. I don't have any debt. But the key is when you look at the statements, like 18.6 annualized rate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's four trillion in credit card debt. So you, you imagine what, what's happening to the people. So lowering interest rates would not look bad because the, the, the point is the people would be paying less in interest. Oh, sure. sure. And they'd have more money to do other things with per se. So uh, that, that, that so is- they should have held. They should that, have stayed they, on they, hold. They, they, the, the excuses are just mind, mind boggling. That's why- this company is doing so well versus CNBC <laughs> because they're losing viewership, <clears throat> nothing against CNBC per se, except they're bulls. And here people get to express and say- What they that, feel, what they, 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 what, what they What they believe, yes. So 
one maybe more nuanced question on this point, just because I think we have a little bit of time. Um, but how do you, as a veteran trader, um, look at the kind of coincident news, i.e. the Fed choosing to hike, stay on, stay on hold, or cut in the moment, versus what the market is pricing in terms of probability of these moves? The reason I ask is because you talk about responses and maybe the way that either policymakers or politicians will do an about face to try and save the market uh, and potentially prevent the recession that otherwise would come in, in six months. But the futures markets and interest rates um, are starting to price that in already, that about face. How do you reconcile the two? You know, what you kind of get in terms of future expectations in the futures market um, versus what happens in the moment uh, on decision day? Okay, well, you, you, you go back to technicals and fundamentals. So you look at the charts, and aside from the charts as a trader, you buy extreme weakness because you know the Fed's going to come in. At this point, they have. They don't want really the markets to continue to go down. They've stabilized them by... I mean, they, you know, look, <clears throat> I've been buying things and selling things for 50 odd years. If you want to buy something and it's your stuff, do you really run up 100 handles in the S&P? No, there was no news that day that it ran. I mean, that's, that's the Fed saying, look, we don't, we're, you know, we don't want to cause a crash here, so we're going to stabilize the markets. So if the markets are going down in an extreme fashion, the later in the day, the better, you you buy some. Now, you don't buy the full boat because, again, it can continue down. You want to average in. But the Fed's going to be there from here on in to stop any crash because they know the eyes are on them. The shutdown has nothing to do with the markets, right? right? <clears throat> the, the so just to be clear, what you're saying is that you do think that we will have the Fed or the plunge protection team, as it's so affectionately right. known, on extreme moves in the market participating. Right. But there's one, there's one contingency to that. When you're a manipulator, <clears throat> uh, you do not buy on bad news. Like with this Apple news, the Fed is not going to spend their money if this Apple news, and I'm expanding, if there was bad news across the board, you're wasting your money because people will sell to you. So you can only buy when the markets are crashing and there's no news. You know, when there's people are unwinding, there's a margin calls or whatever it might be. Sure. So the, the key is that if there's no news and it's quiet and the markets are selling off, that's when you buy. But if there's, if there's news, uh, the uh, GDP is going to be revised down by the Atlanta Fed yeah. to negative. Why fight the, you, you, why fight you, the you, actual you, take? The market's going to go down. Yeah. The Fed can't stop that because people will sell to you. Right. And so you have to be a manipulator. You have to do it when it's quiet. Then you buy it up, and you know that's the way that the game works. Feeds on that's a little bit of a trading pitch there about what I do. But really, right now, the, the key is if you're an investor, you should be extremely conservative, and you should be in, in debt, you should be, I mean, I mean, the yen has gone crazy here. Debt, just you mean government debt. You mean bonds. Government debt, yeah, yep. not corporate debt. And you should be in uh, <clears throat> in gold and, and, and silver and the mining shares, which are on the their, their bottom. And as you see, gold has been going up and silver been going up because people are moving their money to, uh, to defensive positions. Sure. That's why the yen went up. Well, that is a lot of food for thought. I think it's been a great interview. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Hope I asked the right questions. You, you did. And, <laughs> and tell uh, Raul and Grant, I appreciate you know their consideration too. They they got a great business, and it's great to see the interviews that they have put forth so yeah, far. It's great stuff, Victor. Thanks. Thank you. Good talking to you.